Welcome to Gridability, a podcast about the power of perseverance, overcoming seemingly insurmountable odds to attain the life of your dreams. My name is Adam Clausen. I am your host. With me here is my co-host, Ro Clausen. And we are excited to have another episode of Gridability. Uh, we always uh, try and kick things off you know, with something exciting, something positive, great stories that hopefully inspire you. Uh, much of this has been about us sharing our experiences. And recently we talked about um, really how you develop that level of grit ability personally uh, and how that fit into our relationship, how that allowed us not only to individually become the people that we needed to be to have this amazing life, but then figuring out how to do that as a couple, how to build that relationship, how to strengthen those bonds. And there's many things that we have done very intentionally. You know, we talked about our workouts and the things that we do to connect. But I think it's important for us because when we talk about relationships, and that's what I want to focus on today, relationships, in order for us to have the relationship that we have, um, we had to be very, very intentional, not only about creating it for ourselves, but making sure that we were creating the space that we needed in our lives to only allow good people in. Yeah. And it wasn't always the case. No. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It definitely was not always the case. And I'm going to say the, the more obvious is probably my past relationships, right? Because I'm the one that ended up in prison. And although, listen, I take full responsibility for everything that I did. I ran in a lot of circles with a lot of negative people, a lot of negative influences. I put myself in that situation and I had a lot of time, 20 years, five months, 17 days to be exact, to think about all of the things that, that I regret from my past and that was largely the result of the relationships that I chose to invest in, the people that I surrounded myself with, that I, that I chose to be around, um, were definitely not the people who inspired me to become who I am today. They were keeping me from becoming that person that I was meant to be. So you and I have talked a lot about this and, and about what it took for us to uh, be able to move our relationship forward because there were some people that were in the way. Sure. And um, I'm going to share one of, one of mine, one of my early experiences. And that was 2005, prior to our relationship, in me figuring out who I was meant to become because I knew that there was definitely more for me in life. So behind these 40-foot walls of the United States Penitentiary... I was running wild. Like I came in day one, walked onto the compound of this high security federal penitentiary. And I walk onto the housing unit and within, I am telling you under 60 seconds, I was in a cell with a guy who was bagging up wine, homemade wine, who offered me a joint. So I'm smoking, I'm drinking. I haven't even put my bedroll in my cell yet. That's how I started my 213 year sentence. And I lived that way for a number of years, despite, you know, ending up in segregation, uh, you know, in prison, in prison, like you can't possibly fall any further, but I continued to put myself in those situations, surround myself with the wrong people. So here I am uh, a couple years later and I get the notice 2005 that my appeals have run out. There is no chance of parole. There is no chance for, for anything. We either have to get the president to, to sign my release one day, or we have to convince Congress to change the law. Neither of those things is happening anytime soon. So what am I going to do with my life? Right. And it was, it was that, um, it was that omega point. It was a turning point where, you know, I freaked out a little bit when that appeal, I remember opening it up, reading it. And after, you know, I threw my little tantrum, then I was like, okay, now what, what are you going to do? 
And I've shared this previously. I started focusing on myself. I turned inward. But what I haven't shared is, you know, I talked about the, the things that I did to promote health and wellness, but I skipped over what it took for me to get there. And for me, that meant cutting off all those relationships. And for a guy who's serving a life sentence, to call someone or to write someone and say, you know, we can't have contact anymore. I'm not comfortable continuing this relationship because I don't think it's healthy for me. Uh, people thought I was crazy. The people around me on the inside and the people that I was contacting, they're like, you're serving a life sentence. You should be hanging on to every last relationship, every person that you can hold on to, and you're cutting us off? Uh, you've lost your mind. But I realized that those relationships were not of value. They were not adding anything they had been taking for years and years. So for me, one of the most courageous things I had to do was sever those relationships first on the outside. And then as I'm focusing on my health and wellness on the inside, and I, I had to say no to the drinking, to the drugs, and those people, there's one in particular that comes to mind, one of my drinking buddies that was there on the unit with me, I would come back to my cell and I would find, you know, a, a bottle of moonshine on my desk. And I'd be like, damn it, I've told this guy I'm done. But he wasn't ready to let go. Right. And he didn't want me to leave him to be by himself. I mean, there was other people with him. But as we've talked about, when you start changing, that makes other people feel very uncomfortable. Clearly, he and all of the others in that negative circle that I was still maintaining, and I was, you know, somehow choosing to justify it. I'm like, I don't drink that much. I don't really uh, indulge in the drugs that often. And I've mostly quit smoking. I was smoking three packs a day. And I used to be proud of the fact that I'd light a cigarette, leave it burn on the sill while I would sprint a lap, come back and pick it up and get on the pull-up bar. That's absolutely insane. That's just like, oh, what I was doing to myself. And, and hey, I was young. Um, thankfully, my body was pretty resilient. But in finally cutting off those relationships, I was able to then move forward and really invest my time, my energy into cultivating the relationships, first focusing on myself, but then cultivating the relationships that were going to bring value. And I honestly could not have invested in those relationships while still maintaining the old. I had to remove that to create the space that I needed for the new. And it took time. It took time. It took years. This is 2005. By the time you and I met, you know, this is years later, 2009, I needed that time to set a strong foundation for myself to get comfortable in saying no. Because I got to be honest, like it wasn't easy for me when those things kept, people kept bringing things around and they'd tell me like, oh, don't worry about it. You don't, you don't owe me for it right now or even better. You don't owe me anything. I got this one. And I'd be like, no, 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 I don't want it. Like I am comfortable, I am confident in the fact that I can say no and feel good about it. And I knew that I had to do that then, that I had to find some comfort being uncomfortable in that space over time so that eventually I would be prepared to confront that on the outside. So I had some, some practice with that prior to us coming into our relationship and I have said numerous times that without removing those negative relationships, I would not have been at a place where I would have been able to offer you anything. So I'm grateful that I had that experience early on. And I know that you too had similar experiences with um, having to remove negative people from your life. Sure. And for me, it was more about longevity of relationships so I had a friend who I had known since early high school, and 
she was a good friend and she was around for a really long time, but she started to do some not some not so great things. And then it was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back when she stole stuff out of my house, mm. which I was still able to forgive because I could make excuses for her because of, again, the longevity of this relationship. So she stole this Tiffany's bracelet that all my sisters and I pitched in all the pennies we had at the time because we were still in high school and we bought it for her for her high school graduation. So I'm like, well, you know, she has a young son. She doesn't make that much money. But then the straw that did break the camel's back finally was my sister, my older sister offered her a couple hundred dollars to clean the house instead of hiring somebody when we were having a family party because she knew she needed the money. A couple days later, a diamond necklace that my father had bought my mother for Valentine's Day years before went missing. And we searched the house high and low. A couple years later, I go out to lunch with this friend, and there's my mom's diamond necklace on her neck. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I was like, I'm done. Because for all the years prior, I was able to say, well, you know, she does that kind of stuff, but she's a good girl. She does that kind of stuff. And I could make the excuses for her. But at this point, I knew that it was just a drag to me to my family, and it was time to cut her off. And you said it earlier, it takes self-confidence to be able to stand up for yourself and do that and to know what you need and want because it's more comfortable just to let somebody come along and not have to have that difficult conversation and not have somebody in your life. Especially for you, it's like the companionship, the abandonment situation when you're in prison. But it's so much better because it opens that door and it makes room for the right people to come in. Mm. you definitely need that space, right? And I credit that for our relationship, although, and we've shared this, neither one of us was looking for this relationship. We just happened to be at the right place at the right time where we had removed, made the space that we needed for ourselves to be at a good place, and then really open to being able to cultivate that relationship. So I wanna, I wanna touch on, there have been a number of um, persons and couples that you and I have had to figure out whether these were relationships that we wanted to maintain. And, uh, you know, we openly discuss it. And I don't feel bad about, there are some people that I, I think have difficulty in having those conversations, in openly expressing um, whether or not a relationship is good? Like, is this person adding value to your life? And some people are like, what do you mean adding value? Like you expect something from them? I said, no, I want, I want to be very clear here. Any relationship that I'm a part of, like whether it's our relationship, like my responsibility is to bring a hundred percent to that relationship. So any other relationships that we choose to engage in, I need to bring that same hundred percent. I need to know that I am adding value to that person, to their life, to you know whatever time we're able to spend together. That's how I view relationships. And that's why I would say that we have so many meaningful relationships. But sometimes there comes a point where you have to ask yourself, okay, we, we've been friend, I, I'm gonna say friends with these people or maintain this re relationship for a period um, do we need to reassess this and as, as frequent or as often as just recently, Sure, we've had to assess some of those relationships, but I want to go back to the relationship that brought us together, right? Cause, cause this was a challenge. Um, the relationship that brought us together and we shared our story, how, you know, I meet this guy, this guy comes in and ultimately convinces me, hey, you should write this woman, you should write this girl, it's my girlfriend's cousin, blah, 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 not really cousin, right? But he says, man, you should, you should write this person. And, you know, ultimately our relationship, our connection is strong, but there came a point where it wasn't like we weren't connected to them anymore. And we had to separate ourselves and build a relationship because we weren't on the same page with them. Yeah, and I think this was another one of longevity for me. 
And just to clarify, we called each other cousins because our mothers grew up together. And out of respect, I called their parents um, aunt and uncle. But we had been through so much. And then I was another relationship where I was blinded to all of the negativity and not just negativity, like the nasty things that were done to me and around me. And specifically, I'll let you tell the story. Specifically, which which one are you headed to? The one. The one. Okay. The event that you stopped. The event. Hmm. So, you know, prison's its own man. You know, there's a separate culture in prison. There's a it's it's a whole different world. When you used to come up, I used to look forward to, especially when I was behind those forty foot walls in the United States Penitentiary. To get out there to a visiting room to spend a few hours with you, when I tell you it was like I could breathe, and when I would have to go back into that changing room, because you wear separate like prison scrubs out in the visiting room, I'd go back in and I'd put my regular prison clothes on to go back to the unit. It was a process that I had to go through mentally um, to prepare to go back into that environment very, very challenging. Right. And it's, it's all men. And, you know, there are, um, there's certain rules, there are certain guidelines, right. And one of the things obviously in prison is, you know, people don't, don't talk about other people. Um, and you, you can't be one to gossip. And there are some people who like to gossip, right. And, that will get you in trouble. So although we had this relationship, everybody knew, right, that I have this beautiful woman woman coming up to see me, that I am like happier than I've ever been. And people are, are genuinely happy for me. But this other guy, the guy that made this happen, is starting to create some friction right? There's few incidents that take place because I'm a guy that's got a life sentence and I've been there a long time. You know, people would come to me and, and basically say, Hey, can you do something about this? Like this, here's what we think is happening. This guy's talking, he's creating problems. And for me at that point, it's like, okay, what do I do? How do I manage this relationship? Because this is the connection. This is what brought us together. And I, I think part of, because living in that environment, how do I then cut that relationship off? Us maintain this relationship. So I was in a, I was in a tough spot. Uh, and one of the things that worked out for us to our benefit was that he was granted a transfer. He was granted a transfer, move into another facility. Actually, I think it was right next door at the time. So wasn't, wasn't going very far. But the point is he was leaving and for me, it was like, oh, I don't have to deal with this situation. This situation's going to take care of itself, right? And isn't that how most people would prefer to deal with a relationship that you don't want to be a part of, right? You just want circumstances. You want the situation to somehow miraculously, you know, just take care of itself. I don't have to deal with it and I can just walk away. Um, well, of course it didn't. It wasn't that simple because this guy just couldn't keep his damn mouth shut. So we end up, um, and I'll, I'll paint this picture. You know, it, it, prisons are ruled by, by gang culture, right? And you can be associated. You can be friendly with a lot of people. I had zero gang connections, affiliations. I was just friendly with, with everyone. And I had a certain level of respect because of my time, because of my past, because of, because of just who I am, right? The way that I carried myself. This individual did not have that same level of respect, connection. But since I was close to this guy, they came to me and said, hey, this guy is a problem. Like, we're ready to deal with it. Because here's what, here's what happened. We put out a bad story. Just, we threw out some bait, he took it, and he went and spread this information. He's the only one that had it. 
so we know that it was him. I'm like, oh God. Now I know the consequences of this, right? Consequences in prison are very severe. They are swift. It's a cause and effect. There are certain rules that are in place that if they are not followed, then those individuals who did not follow them will be dealt with. It's an unfortunate reality, right? That's just the way things work. And that's how they maintain order within that environment. So here I am in the middle of this situation. The guy has already been approved for a transfer. Can I add this? Yes. When you're approved for a transfer, because I learned this through that story, you're not giving, given a date. Like you're going to move you know, Thursday the 5th of July. It doesn't work like that. You won't know on purpose, because so you can't plan any kind of escape. True. I think that's pertinent to the story. It is. It's very pertinent. So I'm trying to slow this thing down, knowing that the transfer is there, knowing that this repercussion, this thing is about to take place, and they are planning it. They're planning what they are going to do to this guy to get him permanently removed from this place. Or plan it. Or plan it. It's a reality. It happens, right? It's an unfortunate reality. Um, so knowing that all this has taken place, and there were people... Um, who were eager to be a part of removing him because that's the other part of prison. If you don't have a reputation, a lot of people are looking to earn a reputation. So here's this unfortunate guy who has no idea who's bouncing around, all excited about a transfer, has no idea of the danger that surrounds him. I know, and I know that all of these other individuals around him know, and there's not anything that I can say to him because that would have not worked out well for me. The best that I could do on all fronts, because honestly, I didn't want to see anything permanent happen to this guy. I did not agree with what he did. I knew that there was going to be consequences. And I knew that eventually it was going to catch up to him one way or another. My hope was that it would not impact us our relationship, me personally as well, because I'm in close proximity. So trying to manage this whole situation with all of these relationships, the thing is I had built up enough credibility, enough value in the other relationships where people respected me enough to when I asked, can you please hold up on this? So that it, it literally came down to the final day to where he was told, tomorrow, you'll be leaving. You're going to go next door. And he was giddy as could be, all excited. And we went out to the yard. And the yard at this time is a cage. Picture a very large dog kennel, right? That is fenced in. There's a tower above it where they can shoot down into the yard if anything's happening. And you basically walk back and forth. And we are walking in a line, myself, five other individuals, including him. So four plus this individual. We're walking back and forth. And this guy is excited, like just can't keep his mouth shut. And these guys are looking at me like, this is the last chance. If we're going to do this, we're going to do this right now and he's not going to get out of here. And there is a non-verbal conversation that is taking place with me basically saying like, please man, just let it go. Let him just go next door. He will be gone. You will never ever have to deal with him again. That's the best outcome for anybody. And honestly, I didn't want to see it. These guys felt like they were in a position where they had to do something about this, right? And the head of that group was, was a part of this, was right there. And these guys were all ready to go, ready to resolve this situation once and for all. And I am so, so grateful that they did not. I am so grateful that... Um, that they were willing to allow that to happen. And I'm going to say it was largely 
it was because of, of my request. It was because of the relationships that we had built that they allowed that to happen. So back to that nonverbal communication, did they just read your energy and that's what stopped them? There was one point where one individual stepped back and was like, and I'm like, that was it. Okay. Like that was the nonverbal. I'm like, just let it go. I, I knew they weren't going to let it go forever. <laughs> just let it go for now. Um, and, and fortunately it did. And that was one of the few times, you know, in that environment where things worked out, it didn't always work out that way. Um, but that was one of them. And for us, the way that, you know, that movement to the facility next door was, man, for us, I would say it was incredibly liberating, right? Yeah. Because that was also a turning point in our relationship where we were able to remove ourselves from what we realized after the fact was it, it was pretty toxic, right? There was a lot of negativity there, all of that gossip, all of... Uh, those were things that we don't value, that we don't do, right? But it felt like they were a part of our relationship, so it was hard to separate ourselves. But I would say it was that experience early on that helped shape the way that we did the next decade plus in choosing our relationships very, very intentionally, very carefully, and it really prepared us for all the relationships that we now enjoy. Absolutely. And I remember for me, it was a little more difficult to break away from that person. And now looking back, I think that I felt indebted. And this has happened a couple of times since where I felt so indebted to her because she helped introduce you to me and everything was so amazing between us. So I felt almost guilty cutting her off. And that, again, that happened with a different situation where I felt indebted to the person that was basically a scumbag. And you helped talk me through that where, yes, they do something nice, but it's not a, it's, it's not a one shot thing. You know, if they do 25 bad things and one nice thing, you have to look at the whole. hundred mm, percent. And likewise, just as we both did individually, removing those negative people from our lives. That was an integral part of our relationship, setting the foundation early on, identifying the relationships that we did not want, and then being very intentional going forward on choosing who we wanted to, to be aligned with. Um, but obviously there's some challenges in that because of where I am, right? Circumstances that we didn't have entire control over. And I remember, I, I don't know how many times I said it. I said it often to myself and I said it aloud where when I get out of here, because I'm, I'm, I'm locked, right? I live in a fishbowl where, you know, there's a thousand to 1500 people that I have to deal with. I have to see them every day. Like we're trapped in this physical environment that's enclosed. As soon as I get out of here, I'm not going to deal with those people who do not add value to my life. And I would say that we have been very, very good about that. Um, and being able, having the courage, as I said before, when we find those relationships that, that we've invested in, that we thought were, were positive, that were, you know, we are adding value to each other when we came back and reassessed and, you know, we had these open conversations with each other where we'll coach each other through it and ask those questions to determine, is this a relationship we want to continue investing in? I'd say we've been pretty successful with that. Sure. And it goes both ways, right? The negative and you cut that out, it frees up more time to invest in the relationships that you do want to invest in. So yes, I lost my friend that I was going to visit with and having fun with in the off time, but I didn't want to be in that relationship anyway. Well, fast forward, you moved and I was getting ready to go into visit and they would have all of the visitors in this tiny little glass room. We were kind of 
sausage in there. And then they would call you one at a time. They would process your paperwork, get you through the metal detector, and then you would go in the back and you would meet up with your inmate and you would have the visit. Well, there was this girl in there that day, and they were slow, so we were back there for a little while, maybe like an hour, and she was just hysterical, making everybody laugh, like she was adorable, very respectful, and I took note of her, because there weren't many people like that, everyone was in a bad mood, some people were hitting their kids, like it was not the most fun experience, so she was cute. On the way out of visit, we struck up a conversation, and we were cautious, right, because you're meeting somebody in prison, and we exchanged emails. And we emailed back and forth and we developed like the best relationship. We became almost best friends. We would share hotel rooms from then moving forward. She would come up to my house in Jersey, hang out with my family. Uh, She was just great. So I got rid of that one relationship and I I made room for a better one. Mm, Love that. So yeah, it's it's really relationships have been the foundation. Um, Recently I had the opportunity uh, I still, I go into a county jail on a weekly basis. Uh, it's been a highlight of uh, one of my greatest accomplishments since we got out here to Las Vegas. Going back to jail? Going back to jail, right? Biggest accomplishment. The difference is I get to walk out of there, right? I get to go in on my terms. I get to spend some time with... Uh, some people that really are are eager to hear what I have to share, my experience, where I feel that that's a large part of my responsibility. My purpose is being able to give back, to provide that which I wish would have been given to me all those years ago that you know, undoubtedly would have helped to at least change some things. I don't know how much of my life I would have been willing to change, but I never got that opportunity. So I feel that that's part of my purpose, my responsibility. And uh, what I spoke about last week when I was in there was, you know, relationships are the key to, to ultimately your success in all aspects of your life. Choosing your partner wisely, but choosing the people around you. And listen, we are social creatures, right? Perception matters. The way, you know, we view each other matters. If people are not viewing you positively, right? If there are people who decide that they don't want to have uh, a relationship with us, I have to stop and ask, what have I done, you know, that made that person? Did I make that person uncomfortable by a way that we're living? Or is it, is it fact that I am not adding value to that person? And if I have stated that that is, that is my goal, you know, to constantly add value to others, to every relationship that I entered into, that perception matters. The reason I bring this up is because I hear so frequently what other people think of you doesn't matter. And you know, I do not, I do not agree with that. I can't agree with that. It does matter to say that it doesn't is just insane, right? Like if, if you want to be successful, if you want to attract the right people, you have to make sure that what you are putting out is going to bring the right people into your life. And it's your responsibility to make sure that you're uh, projecting that energy and that you're living, you're doing the things on a day-to-day basis that help to attract those people in. And, and for us, I would say we, we try and do that every single day. Yeah, I also love that because it's so selfless, those two questions, where a lot of times, we're in such a fast-paced world right now, that it's all about what can I get from somebody? What can they do for me? But if you ask those two questions to yourself, then it's how can I help them? What's that quote you say all the time about helping enough people get what they want? The key to getting everything that you want in life is to help enough other people get what they want. Yeah, and to me, when you do that, it makes the relationship more genuine, the ones that you want to have in your life and be around. And I would say those people that I immediately look to connect with are, and and I can tell early on in, in in an initial conversation, the tone, the direction that another person's taken is when they're curious about what I'm doing, what we're doing, and they, you know, ask something along the lines of, well, how can I contribute? How can I help you get to where you want to be? And I'm like, wait a minute, that's my question. <laughs> I know that we're on the same page, 
right? I know that we're coming from the same perspective and together as evidenced by our relationship, I know that when you're with the right people building the right relationships, you will get everything that you want in life. And so bringing all of this full circle back to gridability, you know, you and I have talked about how we've demonstrated the courage to do those difficult things on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, that allowed us to become who we were meant to be, but then doing the same thing in our relationships, having the courage to have those difficult conversations, to make those difficult decisions, to remove people and things from our lives that, you know, for a lot of other people are, are perfectly acceptable. And for us to go against the grain, to do what other people are not doing because we want an extraordinary life. And in order to get there, you got to be willing to do extraordinary things, right? Absolutely. And I don't want it to be misconstrued with suffering. I feel as if the last few episodes we've talked about how we had to suffer our way through things, sort of. And we even used to joke around, oh, we're really good at suffering. But I think it's more perspective, versus suffering can suffer in the moment because you're so laser focused on what's on the other side of that. If that mm, makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Perfect sense. And I think that that's a great place for us to really wrap things up for today. Uh, talking about developing gridability, not only, you know, individually us as a couple and really focusing on, you know, the power of perseverance, overcoming seemingly insurmountable odds, to attain this life that we have very intentionally designed for ourselves and that we continue to build on as we move forward. My name is Adam Clausen. And I'm Ro Clausen. And we'll see you back here on the next episode of Gridability.